good evening friends and my name is purnendu kavuri i am professor in ecology and development at the azim premji university and my job here is to welcome you all on behalf of the azim premji university to this lecture series and particularly to today's lecture which is jointly organized with atri i would like to briefly mention why this series of lectures are being organized and a few words about the nature of the university where i work the azim premji university is in some ways a university which has uh, drawn students and faculty from diverse walks of life we have in our faculty people who have had long histories of activism of engagement with communities we also have academics our student community is drawn from an equally diverse range of people from provincial towns from small backwaters of india coming in from diverse academic profiles people who have worked for many years our objective is not simply to produce high quality academicians but to produce thinking reflective practitioners who would like to go and engage for a substantial part of their life in work based on a process of reflection and learning there are two broad courses that we offer one in education and the other in development this present series of uh, lectures is organized by the university to uh, uh, share uh, some of the concerns of the university with a wider audience by inviting people uh, uh, distinguished uh, people from different walks of life to talk about some of the issues that concern them and concern society some of the names of the people who have individuals have come and spoken here are an academician shri vishwanathan aruna roy george soros most recently joseph stiglitz was here bruno latour david o and our guests today uh, today's lecture is particularly important for us because at the university we realize very well that especially when we are engaging with development and society much as economic considerations were a driving an important critical element of thinking about development in the last century in the century ahead environmental and ecological issues are probably going to lie at the center of our political practical and intellectual engagement which is why we are specially happy to invite our guests for today's lecture i will request uh, dr ganesh palachandran director of atri to introduce the speakers thank you i have a lot to say but i have limited time so i must make sure i say the right things uh it also gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the launch of an extraordinarily beautiful book i think uh, you might have seen some of the pictures felt the book uh the himalayas of course have uh, have always been my passion this has been a labor of love for two extraordinarily talented people of course differing in age but uh, one a scientist a researcher and a conservationist dr kamal bawa and the other a wonderful photographer sandesh kador i won't say much about sandesh even though there's a lot to be said i think i leave that to uh, dr bawa now there are lots of stories about dr bawa and myself i've known him for three decades uh, we are still very good friends so that must say a lot about him less about me uh he was a professor and he continues to be a professor at the university of massachusetts in boston i was a banker in new york now one working on tropical forests and one working in uh, 
a tropical, uh, not a tropical, but a concrete jungle. But then we got together in the 90s, he founded Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment. That's what A3 is. And uh, from a very small seed that he has planted, today it's grown into a, a significant organization. Now, Dr. Bawa was a, was a, I would say a was, I'll underline that, was a plant reproductive biologist. He was looking very closely at the style and the pistil and the stamen. I think that's what gave him the eye for detail when later on he took to photography. I think uh, even an old dog can learn some new tricks and that's where he has begun to show his passion. But his passion for the Himalayas, I think, the root of it lay or lies in the fact that he found his wife there. And I think that passion has continued and he has also gone on to Central America and South America and has done some extraordinarily uh, interesting work. But going from a, a pure biology work to conservation, looking at landscapes, involving the people, and so on and so forth, and building institutions. That's the hardest part. And uh, three years ago, maybe three, three and a half years ago, uh, Jayshree, my wife, and I visited with him in uh, Lachung, in Sikkim. And it was a misty day. I think if Omar Khayyam was there, he would have thought this was the most amazing place on earth, or uh, like heaven. And uh, the, while the two ladies sat in the vehicle, Dr. Bawa and I, we stepped out, and I was watching him. He was watching the sunbird flit from a rhododendron to a rhododendron. There were primulas all over. I was watching him, and it was amazing, the amount of interest and passion as he trudged, trudged along with his backpack and camera. Some of those pictures, you can literally touch and feel on the pages there, on the uh, pictures outside. Uh, all this work from the past is receiving attention today. Uh, I think it will receive greater attention in India, but so far it's been, he's been elected uh, uh, to the Norwegian Academy of Sciences, to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, where he's probably hobnobbing without our knowledge with the Hollywood actors who are also in that academy. He also got the first Gunnaris Award for sustainability science, which is the world's first, prize, first award for sustainability science. So whether you call it a Nobel or you call it whatever, it's a Gunnar's Award for Dr. Bawa. Now, he set up uh, Ashoka Trust, which is Atri, and not to tom tom too much, but I think we need to feel proud about things that others do as well. It's been rated as the top-notch think tank in the field of environment in Asia. It's number 19 in the world for the past two years. Now don't ask me what the metrics were, what the parameters were, but that's what it is. It gives us uh, a great pleasure and a hope that we can improve upon this. He's been my mentor and friend, and now I call upon him to say what he went through and say something about the book. And uh, so, Dr. Bawa. Good evening, and thank you very much for joining us this evening. I have a number of people to thank. I better do it now because I don't know how it's going to end. And first of all, Premji University, we are very grateful to them for offering us the facilities and for a place in this series. I also want to thank Atri, a number of my colleagues. People often ask me, how do you do it? I think it's the inspiration of my colleagues that drives me. And of course, I thank Bala for his very generous introduction. For me, to stand here and talk about biodiversity I think it's a privilege. I was born and raised in dusty plains of Punjab. The only symbols of biodiversity there are weeds of field and rice. So it was not until 1960 that I had the opportunity to go to the Himalaya. And like many others, I was struck and enthralled by the beauty of the mountains, by the richness of life. 
two years later, when I was starting my PhD work in 1962, I had the opportunity to go to the Eastern Himalayas, Darjeeling and Sikkim. First day, I can recall every second of that day. It was something I had never seen before. I had seen the Himalayas, I thought, but this was something unusual. Everywhere there was this immense richness of life, the diversity of life, the likes of which you can barely imagine. I worked in the Western Himalayas for my master's thesis on orchids. There were 30 species of orchids in the Western Himalayas. In the state of Sikkim alone, there are more than 430 species of orchids, and many remain to be documented. The state of Sikkim probably occupies less than 0.0025%, something like that, of India's total area. And yet, it contains almost all, almost quarter of India's species of plants and animals, more than one quarter of India's species of plants and animals. The state of Sikkim, and Bala explained to you why I'm so fond of the state, <laughs> is probably one twentieth the size of the Western Ghats. And yet, it probably contains almost as many species of plants and animals as the Western Ghats. I think what I want you to do is to take you to this incredible journey of which I have been a part of for more than 50 years, going to the Himalayas almost every year, though I did disappear in the jungles of Central America for almost 35 years, but I have kept my passion and interest in the Himalayas for all these years. And I want to first start with showing you this incredible diversity. We are very close to China and India border. This area is at about 15,000 feet. Can I have a little bit of lights because I can't see people? And I think the slides would be fine. I don't think Sandesh and I had to establish our credibility in terms of the type of photos we take. Uh, so can I have some lights, please? So what is this? Anybody has any idea? What is this? Is it living? Non-living? I took this photograph from about half a kilometer away. And I see these structures emerging from the rhododendron scrub, which is about one feet tall. And these structures are about six feet tall. It's Sikkim rhubarb. The translucent white bracts of the plant trap sunlight in this very cold, harsh environment, providing a very warm place to all the insect pollinators that visit the flowers. 
incredible sight. I had only two hours. The fog was creeping in, and I knew I had very little time because the next day I was supposed to take the flight from Bagdogra to Bangalore to attend the ATRI board meeting. Think of your priorities. And I didn't think that that was that critical or important to be at the board meeting, but you make many st stupid decisions in life, and that was probably one of those, to leave this plant and not left leaving it there and not trying to find as much as I want to. Primulas, primroses, center of origin and diversification is, are the Himalayas. There are about 100 species in India, and there are probably 300 species on the other side in China. Impatience, very, very rich. And again, a number of species, we don't know how many species are there of impatience in the Himalayas. Probably 150, a conservative guess. And then, of course, the rhododendrons. More than 100 species in India, it, on the Indian part of the Himalayas, and about 300 on the other side in China. A diversity of flowers, different colors, and mostly pollinated by sunbirds. And of course, this diversity is tied with tremendous cultural diversity in the region. And this diversity finally sustains livelihoods of the millions of people, even in very remote areas. Who are these people? in the slide. Anybody has any idea? No, Sandesh, keep quiet. You will have your chance. What are they doing? I can tell you, they are not hiking or trekking. Yes, back there. Anand, no. You're not supposed to talk. Anand is my graduate student. <laughs> These people in Nepal, they are collecting golden worm, caterpillar fungus, hundreds of them, thousands of them, left their home for a month or so come and camp in this very harsh, cold environment for this. The world's most precious biological commodity. The price of this caterpillar fungus has exceeded the price of gold. It exceeded the price of gold by weight about eight months ago. Now, my graduate student, Uttam, who is from Nepal, tells me that the price of this fungus has exceeded three times the price of gold. The world's most precious biological commodity collected by the world's poorest people. And it, the quantities collected are declining the issue of nature that came out today carries a new story about our work. And just before I came, there were some inquiries from Hindustan Times 
about the state of this caterpillar fungus in India. It occurs in India. It is collected very widely in India, but we don't know the magnitude of the trade, and we don't know the status of populations in the Indian part of the Himalayas. So there is this incredible biodiversity, and it's changing. There is change in the Himalayas, environmental change. Land use change. It has consequences for biodiversity. There are many, many drivers of bio, uh, land use change. And one of the drivers is expansion of agricultural frontier. And these people who are advancing into the forest frontier, they are, very, they are small landholders, very poor people, marginal people trying to cultivate land in marginal, harsh, unstable environments. It's not something people do by choice. It's because people don't have other options. We'll come back to that. How, in the face of this poverty, how, in the face of these subsistence needs of small landholders, we conserve biodiversity. It's a major challenge. And yet, the linkage between poverty and conservation remains largely unexplored, especially in a place like India. Climate change. We hear about climate change in the Himalayas. We hear about glaciers. There is a controversy about the melting of glaciers, the magnitude of this melting. There has been a recent study by the National Academy of Sciences that seems to indicate although the glaciers are somewhat stable in the western Himalaya, but in the eastern Himalayas, the glaciers are melting very fast. But there is a dearth of knowledge. And some of my students and I have tried to fill this gap in knowledge by taking a very unusual approach. We have conducted household surveys, trying to assess the perceptions of people about climate change. And what we have found is people seem to be not only very knowledgeable about climate change, but they are already adapting to climate change. Most people feel that the weather is getting warmer, water resources are drying, and there is erratic monsoon. People feel that there is early bud burst and the other species of plants, wild species of plants, are flowering earlier. There are more agricultural pests and weeds and mosquitoes have been noted as high as 8,000 feet in altitude. But we are not re relying only on people's perception. Another study that was done by a graduate student of mine, looking at records, various types of data, found that during the period 1982 to 2006, Himalayas have warmed up by 1.5 degrees centigrade. This is three times the global average. Rainfall has increased 
by 165 millimeters and phenology that is onset of greenness has advanced by five days. So what people are seeing is confirmed by the scientific data we have available. We all know the consequences of this climate change. Eight of Asia's largest river originate in the Himalayas. And the basins of these river sustain the livelihoods of almost 25% of the humanity, 1.3 billion people. Hydropower, another agent of change. This is in North Sikkim, in very remote part of North Sikkim. And let me again give you some indications of the amount of hydropower or the number of hydropower projects. I don't know whether you can read that or not, but currently hydropower plants in India generate about 20,000 megawatts of energy. The plans are that during the next 20 years, hydropower projects in India will generate about 125,000 megawatts of energy, six-fold increase. And again, there was a recent paper published, I think just last week in Science, by Maharaj Pandit, who had worked in Delhi University, showing how the density of dams in eastern Himalayas is now highest in the world, in a seismically very, very active zone. I'm not advocating here against the dams. We all need energy to sustain the lifestyles we lead. But the question is, have we considered all the alternatives? Have we assessed all the impacts? Have we taken into account all the risks? And the answer is not clear. So there is change underway. Change, the type of change the Himalayas have not seen before. I think Sandesh and I were reading the journal of J.D. Hooker, the British explorer who first went to Darjeeling and Sikkim around eight, in the 1840s. And he talks about Darjeeling, that as he comes out, he see forests all around him. Dense forests, dense thick forests. You now go to Darjeeling, you come out, you hardly see any forest. It doesn't take that much time for the earth to be transformed. Surely it took, when I took, when I went to the Himalayas for the first time, Eastern Himalayas, this was about 120 years after Hooker has been there, and the change was just unimaginable. But during the last 50 years, the rate of change has been just many, many times higher than during the first 150 years. I want to mention uh, very, very briefly uh, what is ATRI's approach to some of these issues. We are working in the Eastern Himalayas. We try to generate knowledge that is integrated across disciplines, knowledge systems, and geographical scales. Knowledge that is usable. Knowledge that is credible, salient, and relevant. 
I think here I come to again Azim Premji University and ATRI, we share, we share this passion for generating knowledge that is relevant, that is immediately applicable. But generation of knowledge, even useful knowledge, is not enough. This knowledge must be linked to action and changes in governance and policies to build sustainable landscapes. We, build, we must build environmental leadership, something again we share with the Premji University. And finally, we have to engage civil society in efforts to conserve our heritage and avoid, of course, a wide variety of other stakeholders. I don't know what happened. It's supposed to move. Doesn't matter. Let me conclude. I think my slide, next slide, was of Kanchanjanga and of a sunbird and of a small farmer. And what I was going to say was that although the situation looks grim, we are in a new era. And what I was going to say was that as the first rays of sun hit Kanjanjinga and the sunbird comes out for its first meal and the farmer gets up to ponder over the use of local biodiversity, we have unprecedented opportunities to generate knowledge in a way we had never imagined before. We have unprecedented opportunities to bring stakeholders together, to engage civil society, we have never conceived before. And our effort to produce this book is a continuation of our attempt to engage civil society in our efforts. Himalaya's Mountain of Life is a sequel to the first book Sundesh and I did on Sahadri's India's Western Ghats. And we will continue our journey to areas, to document, and of course photograph the incredible biodiversity we have. And I'm glad you will join this effort with us. You are already part of this exercise. And with these comments, I want to introduce now Sandesh. who needs, in a way, no introduction, especially in Bangalore. I first met Sandesh in a conference on the Western Ghats. And I was contemplating writing a book on the Western Ghats because I think three months earlier, I had met Mr. Nandan Nilekhani and he asked me if there's a book on the Western Ghats he could read. I couldn't point him out to any book. So Sandesh came out of this conference and I introduced myself and my second sentence was, Sandesh, do you want to do a book with me? And Sandesh was just, he had not known me before, this is our, we had not met more than five seconds, and here I am talking with him about the book. And he said, of course. And that's how I met Sandesh, and it has been a, an incredible partnership. 
I'm not going to tell, all, tell you all the awards he has won. I think it's easier to mention the awards he has not won. His winning awards in photography is almost an everyday occurrence. And I don't even pay much attention to it. <laughs> he has done documentaries for BBC, for National Geographic Society, and he is truly, I think, an asset to India and the way I want to conclude my introduction to Sandesh is that I have not met a person who is as generous, as kind as he is. And humility, that's another trait that characterizes Sandesh. Here, Sandesh, it's all yours trying to make me blush and forget what I was about to say for the talk. But uh, nevertheless, it wasn't the first time that I've said, of course. The first time I um, was asked to make a documentary about the Western Ghats, I told my professor in the US, of course. I'd never used a video camera before. <laughs> I'd never done anything with a book before. I had no idea which way to start, the end or the front or, or how to even begin. Similarly, when we decided to start this uh, whole book launch thing, I wasn't quite sure where to start. You know, where do you start the journey? So let me try to switch over to my talk. And um, so we decided that we would start from the beginning. So one thing we've all spoken about a lot is the Himalaya, but uh, our book particularly is about the Eastern Himalaya. And that's the area that has an amazing amount of biodiversity and biocultural diversity, and that's what we were after. And Dr. Bayer just finished by talking briefly about the Western Ghats book. And that's an area where I grew up. I had spent over six, eight years just hiking, trekking through the Western Ghats when I met Dr. Bawa at the conference. I had finished the documentary, which, had which was a three-month summer college project, which ended up being a four-year affair, where much to my parents' dismay, I, I, uh, I uh, um, gave up on college and came back to India with a video camera, which I had no idea how to use and started making a documentary, which Dr. Bawa saw at the conference, and he said, how about converting this into a book? How about you do this? Let's do this together. I said, sure. And six months later, or uh, actually about a year and a half later, we compiled this book about the Sahyadris, India's Western Ghats, a vanishing heritage. And we took it all the way across to Delhi, where Manmohan Singh Ji and Abdul Kalam Ji, they saw the book. And one of the first comments that uh, Manmohan Singh Ji said when he saw the book is, now, how do we prevent this heritage from vanishing? And very smartly, Dr. Bawa had a conservation action plan written. He said, this is how, the first couple of steps. So, first of all, it's very hard to get anything related to conservation on the central government's agenda. So, the book was like a door stopper. You know, they couldn't quite shut the door on the book. So we made our entry and we were able to get a few things into the agenda at the time and it was very important for the Western Ghats, you know, corridors um, and, 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 and of course there's a lot of grassroots work being done by a lot of NGOs across the country and in particular in the south and with ATRI as well, building grassroots um, support, education and, and engaging civil society at the grassroots level. What was really required was support from the top down and the book, in many ways, helped cement that. And, and I was very happy when recently the uh, documentaries and the book that uh, we had done over the years were used as some of the submission dossiers to establish the Western Ghats as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, something we must all be very proud of. But of course, making the book took a heavy toll on me. I lost half my hair. so. 
it would, it would be ridiculous for me to just say, of course, the next time Dr. Baba said, let's do another book together. So that was two, 2007. And Dr. Bala very, very nicely invited me on a, on a trip to Sikkim, to the Eastern Himalaya. And, and um, I'm a sucker for travel. I said, free trip? Oh yeah, sure, why not? So uh, we hadn't quite established anything about a book or anything because the last thing I wanted to do after the Western Ghats book was to actually do another book. That was it. That was like too much work. So. In 2007, he said, let's go on a trip to Sikkim. I said, of course, I've never been to the Himalayas. To me, the limit of my mountain experience at that time was the Western Ghats. You know, Anemuri, about 3,000 meters above sea level. That's about 8,000, 9,000 feet. And little did I know that I'd be ending up here at about, this is Lake Gurudongmar at uh, 17,000 feet above sea level. So life was in slow motion at that elevation. And so we spent a good, uh, a good couple of hours working in that area. And it's um, one of those places which um, you, know, you have very little oxygen. So your thought process, your, your body and your thought process is very slow. And spent time photographing this. And at that same time, around that time is when Dr. Bauer said, so how about doing a book on the Western Ghats, I mean on the Himalaya? You know, he took advantage of my delirious low oxygen state of mind. And um, five years later, here we are, presenting to you Mountains of Life. But, 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 wait, wait, wait. I'm jumping ahead of myself here. So we need to take a step back. So that was 2007, but work didn't get started till about 2009 when we decided that we would cover this part of the Eastern Himalaya, which we hadn't even quite established. We didn't know which area we would be covering, what are the boundaries of the Eastern Himalaya. We, it was still a bit of an exploration process. And there was a lot of research that we started doing. And um, as you all know, this region used to be called the Northeast Frontier Agency with a lot of turmoil. Visitors, travelers used to uh, shy away from this place because it was quite dangerous in many ways. So the first place that we went to or we started, we started our journey in the state of Assam. And Gauhati is the gateway to the northeast. And that was the, the first place that uh, we landed or the first place I started my project at. And um, it, it was quite not the warm welcome that I expected to receive. So this was everyday occurrence in the news. In 2009, I think there were about uh, a series of bomb blasts across Gauhati especially, and in that area, which killed over 90 people. So while I was actually in the town of Gauhati, I used to be extremely paranoid. But of course, that's where we, you had to start all our work, and that's, where, that's how it all got started. And after a while, I met people in Gauhati, and I, and I asked them, so how do you deal with this? How do you cope with this? You know, a bomb blast here, do you go to the market? I mean, is it safe for me to go to the market? They said, ah, don't worry about it. You know, it happens. You know, we, you never know when it's going to happen, but it happens, and people just get on with their lives. But I decided I'd flee Gauhati. So I always used to run away. And here's a short clip of, um, my first experience of getting there, and um, we decided to put a few video clips together. So this is the first of these video clips called Northeastern Diaries. I hope we have sound. This is an ancient realm of mountain kingdoms and forested valleys rich in natural and cultural treasures. Hidden with rugged boundaries are a range of landscapes, from snow-covered peaks and lush rainforest to alluvial floodplains of tall grass and woodland. This amazing diversity of habitats supports an even more astonishing variety of life. always a part of life. And we'll actually be talking a little bit about technology 
as we come up on the next slide. Da, 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 da. Oh, reserve battery power. Apologies. Our power had been suspended, but now we're back up and running. That was intermission. My name is Sandesh Kadoor, and I'm on a mission to document this diversity before it disappears forever. My first stop, Gauhati, the capital of Assam, a state known more for its tea than for its spectacular wildlife. This is also the gateway to much of northeastern India. This is where my adventure as a photographer and filmmaker begins. I head east from Gauhati along the mighty Brahmaputra River. And so my journey began heading into the northeast. And one of my first and uh, most favorite areas to actually visit was this place called Kaziranga. It's really India's grassland wilderness. And it's probably the closest you'll get to feeling that uh, sense of being in Africa, but still being within the confines of the country. In this image, you have uh, Kaziranga's big five. You have the buffalo, the rhino, the tiger, the, uh, the, the barasinga, as well as the elephants. And the grass is so tall that even elephants feel tiny, especially in relation to uh, giant silk cotton trees. And this, was a, this, this became my base, my base camp. From here, I started to explore areas up in Arunachal Pradesh, going off to Eagle Nest and uh, other places. And I just made a small temporary base camp in this place and started to, when, whenever I wasn't working, I was still taking images. So that's the best part about being in this area. Uh, the rhino, the pride of Assam. And one of my goals was not just to take um, documentary images of animals, but to try to evoke some kind of spirit and mood and try to show these animals in their landscape in, in a very different way. And also, uh, the best part about 2009 was that technology finally caught up with me. I was waiting for it for a long time because all, these, all, all the days prior to this, I was always carrying a video camera on one side, a still camera on the other side, a sound recording unit on the other side. It was just too much equipment. Even now it's too much equipment. But luckily, all these technologies combined and converged to make one unit, one DSLR unit, be able to capture high definition video, amazing uh, uh, audio, as well as capture high resolution images for the book. So I was thankful for uh, Canon in particular to come up with this technology for us to, to benefit. I had a short video clip here showing the benefits of this technology, but I took it out because I didn't want you get to, to get you too spoiled with uh, video. The book is still awesome. Now, another person to join me on my trip to the uh, Northeast was my field assistant, Chin Mairane, who's here somewhere in the audience. Uh, you'll find him, so feel free to bug him with questions as to how it's actually like to be a field assistant. It's not an easy job. So we headed off to different places, and, and uh, here's a short uh, sequence of sitting in a hide to get one particular image I was after, which was, um, a, a, well, let, let, watch the clip, and then I'll explain the, the clip. Jungle crows continue where the tiger left off. Bronze-winged jacanas go about their daily business. A pied kingfisher feeds on little fish. I sit and wait.
days sitting in the hide, and all I've had is one brief glimpse of the tiger. Reviewing the footage, I see that he's not very happy with the camera traps being there. He snarls at one of them before disappearing. I decide it's time to remove all the camera traps. So that was my experience of um, sitting in the hide for six days, non-stop, waiting to get an image of a, of a tiger feeding on a rhino carcass. The only good part was that I wasn't downwind from the carcass. And I finally got the image, which uh, was shot with a camera trap. Thanks to the likes of um, a person in the audience today, Andre Pitte, um, who helped me actually get the, get the lights to work. And, and it's, um, uh, it's a very complicated setup. But suffice it to say that uh, technology plays a, a big part in our journey to document these things. And people like Andre, who has actually designed all the CDT camera traps and all of that, they help us photographers in the field make technology work. And I thank them very much for this which helped get this image of a tiger feeding on a rhino carcass and shows the kind of behavior. Uh, oh, by the way, the rhino was not killed by the tiger, which is probably one of the questions that most people have in their mind. It's two tons and too big for a rhino to, I mean, for a tiger to actually overcome. It was a rhino that had died of uh, uh, old age. Its horn had been taken off. And then about six days later, the tiger started to feed on the rhino. So. After Kaziranga and after Assam, one of the places that I naturally went to was um, Arunachal. And Arunachal is one of those states not only known for its biodiversity, but also for its ethnic diversity. And this is a place where even now, in these far remote corners of Arunachal, you find people who you think may, may be something that you'd see a thousand years ago, or even, you know, even older. The, there's a piece of wood on the back that's one single tree trunk and that probably spreads about 14, 15 feet and on that you can actually see the story of biodiversity that's carved into the log. There's an elephant, uh, you can see the elephant on the, on the far corner on that side, a pangolin, a dog there, there's a king cobra somewhere, a skull and this is the area called the Morung where the, the Naga elders used to come sit together, meet, talk and talk about um, stories from nature and, and hunting is a big part of the culture in, in that area. And um, the morrowing is much like the, uh, the boys club where it, only the men are allowed here. And one of the other places that I covered in Arunachal was a place called Pakke, which is a low elevation evergreen forest uh, just at the base of the, um, uh, of the, of the Himalayan mountain range, the foothills and one of the best places to see hornbills. And when I went there and I saw these wreathed hornbills in big numbers, I was just fascinated. And, and one of the other things was trying to find all of these species, trying to maximize my time in one place and do as much as possible in one area instead of trying to travel all over. So we, did, we decided to do a, an expedition to Pakke because this was an area that, uh, uh, well, scientists and researchers had been to in a limited way and what we wanted to focus on was reptiles and amphibians. So uh, Dr. Bawa and I, we discussed it and we planned it. We, we, we worked on getting permits, which of course, you know, in India is very easy to get, a year in advance. And we got all the permits required, got all the groundwork done, got everything in place, only to find out that a day before our trip, a senior IFS officer was kidnapped. So we had foreigners and all this on our, on our expedition. And um, of course, the DFO there would not allow us to come anywhere close. And after a whole year's planning, a day before the trip, everything was canceled. It shifted to Expedition Tale Valley. So sometimes, you know, some of these things are very fortuitous. And uh, we had a great time in Tale Valley.
I'm not going to play you the whole clip. You can watch it online. It's about six minutes long. But to move on quickly, this was a higher elevation area, and we had no idea what we were going to get. We had a team of herpetologists with us, Karthik Vasudevan from uh, Wildlife Institute of India, Jerry, from, uh, Jerry Martin from Bangalore, and a host of other people who joined us on this trip to help us uncover some of the lesser known species from this mountain range. And, um, and of course we were disappointed because you have the, the herps are especially prevalent in low elevations. At 2,000 meters, there's less and less and less. But we were incredibly happy when we found this guy. This is a species of lizard called a japalura, a type of forest lizard that uh, not many people know about. And as a matter of fact, we broke our own head on this one for many, many months. And only then we realized, OK, it can't be anything but a new species. And that's what the Himalaya is incredible for. Even now, in those little crags and crevices, in those remote valleys, there are still many species to be found and to be named. And if you saw in Dr. Bauer's presentation earlier, the number of dams coming up in this region, many species will be destroyed before we even know they existed. And that's the sad truth and the sad fact of, of what's going on in that region. And one of the reasons why a book such as this was important to try to bring out all of this to the public, to the attention of the government, and hopefully get better protection in, in this mountain range. The um, upper tenny, the upper tenny are, are the people in and around this place called Zero, which is very close to Tale Valley. And it's a high elevation, flat plateau. So we had a great time uh, uh, looking for amphibians and reptiles in this region. Uh -oh. All right, do we count him? That's actually uh, the, the things from the previous clip. But can anyone guess where this is from, the four images on the screen here? The first person to guess gets a free calendar. What was that? Sikkim? Bhutan. Whoever said Bhutan, please collect your free calendar at the, at the, at the front. Yes. So this is Bhutan, uh, one of my favorite places to spend my time. And you see that uh, the animal on the bottom is a takin. And then you have the national flower, the blue poppy, and the national bird, the, um, uh, the raven. So we spent a lot of time in Bhutan, went there on several trips. And it's one of those places that is just absolutely mesmerizing. And the beauty of it is also the fact that um, tourism is lim limited in a big way. And um, uh, uh, spending time there, especially after leaving the plains of India and then going to an area that's actually very sparsely populated, was one of the most incredible things. It was, it was an amazing feeling of liberation. So I spent time hiking up to this place called uh, Tiger's Nest, Takstang Monastery. And uh, it's about a four hour hike from this place called uh, Paro. And one of the things I realized that on the walls of this ancient monastery are paintings which are not very different from images that I would produce today of a raptor carrying away a, a snake. And so it was quite incredible to, to go along and to see that the people uh, back then, did, they didn't quite have the technology, technological progress with uh, fancy cameras, but yet they captured it in art. And that was incredible to see this kind of relationship uh, between nature and culture spread over you know, hundreds of years. And one of my most memorable images from, the, from this whole trip was this image of an atlas moth, one of the largest moths in the world with a 12-inch uh, wingspan. Golden langurs, another specialty from this uh, eastern Himalaya. And clouded leopards. We got very lucky with, uh, uh, with this project where we hand-reared these cubs, literally, with the Wildlife uh, uh, Trust of India and the veterinarians. We worked very closely with them. And we made a documentary called Return of the Clouded Leopards, which is airing on television now, so you can catch it sometime. Uh, but the, the best part about doing these documentaries while also doing the book 
was it helped me spend a max, my maximum, and then while working on the book, as the book take, took shape, I lost shape. <laughs> Transformed into someone lost at sea. And I was buried in books. And let me tell you, this is the part that I dreaded. The, I, I, I loved the first part, you know, from 2009 to 2012, roaming around the mountains and spending all that time. But then having to come back, sit down, and work, and, and then read like a million other books to actually write your book and, and, and try to figure out what you saw was, was really frustrating, but at the same time very rewarding. Um, so with that, we've come to the end of my talk, but I want to, before I finish, I do want to say that uh, although we've come up with this book and it's out there for all of you to see, it isn't the effort of one individual or two individuals. There are a number of people that we need to thank that behind the book, you know, all our colleagues and friends at Atri and all our friends at, uh, in the Northeast and all, our, all the people who gave us the kind of resources we needed to write the book here. And our editor, who's not here, Reinmar from in the US, as well as two people who I'd like to mention here, who are in the audience, who I'd like for them to stand up, uh, Priya Singh and George Tengmutil. So these two people who are probably hiding, but I can't see them, were, were responsible for actually putting the whole thing together and Dr. Bawa and I had the pleasure of giving them an incredibly hard time. They reread and read the text a hundred times over. George redesigned I don't know how many pages before we finally came to what you have here. So I'd like to thank them very much. And uh, with that, Dr. Bala, I'd like to hand it over to you. After that, uh, I don't know what to say. But anyway, I have to uh, introduce Rohini. And uh, that's a great privilege of mine as well. Uh, of course, she doesn't need any introduction in Bangalore, especially. And of course, she's telling me not to introduce her. That's correct. We don't need to introduce you in Bangalore. but. Dilakani's name is a household word, especially because we all have to have the Aadhaar cards, right? <laughs> I first met her about five or six years ago when I was at the Ford Foundation, and even then I knew she was an activist philanthropist. I mean, that's a new combination where somebody is really passionately committed to a cause, opens up their pocketbook, but is also willing to put a lot of time and effort into it. So not to embarrass her, uh, I certainly think that's an admirable quality. She's an ex-journalist. She's a founder, chairperson of uh, Argium, and uh, also the chairperson of uh, Pratham Books. And uh, more recently, I've gotten to know her even better. Uh, she's a member of the board of governors or board of directors of uh, Atri, Ashoka Trust. And uh, yeah, she's pushing us to do better things. And I think uh, it's a privilege for me to welcome you and to introduce you, Rohi. I would like to uh, give Rohini, even, without, even though she didn't guess Bhutan, she's going to get a copy of the book. Now she will uh, moderate a session or facilitate a discussion between the authors and so Rohini. Namaste everyone. Thank you. It's a great. Uh, let's have the lights on so we can um, sort of have a conversation for about 10 minutes with them but then have a little interaction with all of you for another 10 minutes. Uh, it's a great honor and privilege to be with two of my most favorite people whom I admire very greatly and more, the more I meet them, the more I admire them. Just look at this book. I mean, I urge you all, if you can't, if some of us can't afford this, how much does it cost, Dr. Baba? 
Only 5,000 rupees, right? Pool your money, do whatever it takes. Give this book to as many people as you can. Share with them how much of our natural heritage we can be proud of and how much is going to disappear unless everyone in this room makes it a point to, to, to be part of the journey to save it. So um, you all have beautifully described your journey and I was privileged enough to go to both Kaziranga and Sikkim with them. And it's, it, can you just straight off the bat tell us what people like us must do and must not do in order that the Sayadris and the Himalayas and various other biodiversity hotspots in this country remain as rich as they are today? Just very briefly, what must we do and what must we not do? Uh, I think uh, two things I would like to say. One is, I think we have to look at biodiversity as more than just beautiful plants and animals. Uh, biodiversity uh, is associated with ecosystem services and many of us derive a lot of benefits from natural habitats, water, soils, pollinators that service our crops and so and so forth. And the second point I'd like to make is that very often we have a view of conservation uh, oriented towards animals, uh, magnificent tigers and elephants, and no doubt uh, they, are, they are magnificent and very beautiful and very enchanting uh, creatures. Uh, but we have to look at biodiversity as a whole, uh, and it's not the animals, it's plants, microorganisms. Now we are finding you know, that our bodies, our bodies are just huge ecosystems with thousands of different species of bacteria. And that's what keeps us going. And I think we have to look at it from that point of view. It's the biodiversity, different components that keep the world going, that keeps the ecosystem going. And so we have to have a more nuanced view in terms of what needs to be done. And we are not uh, necessarily advocating you know, that you have to just lock up this nature, but how we can sustain it, how we can manage it. So, uh, so, so, so you're saying we have to love the cockroaches along with the tigers? No, we don't have to learn the, necessarily the cockroaches. What I'm saying is that very often our notions of what is, what is, what is life is, is somewhat... Sure, but I quickly want you to say, what is the message of HD of all the work that you do? Do we have to, uh, you know, give up? You know, in the Economic Times, they recently told us that some of the wealthy in this India keep Lamborghinis in their living rooms. Do we have to give up our Bentleys and our Lamborghinis uh, in order that the Himalayas um, uh, are preserved? Or is it much more of a nuanced trade-off? I think it's, uh, I will, uh, uh, well, it depends on the meaning of the nuanced trade-offs, but certainly all over the world, yeah, use this, use this. Yeah. Use Certainly this. all over the world, people are looking at baby, 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 and a whole series of things. And I think that awakening is there. That awakening is also very much uh, in India. And I think we have to continue that toward that path. Right. And quickly, if I go on, just someone said to me that the very rich uh, use unrenewable resources, re non-renewable resources. And the poor often have to use renewable resources, but because of their poverty, perhaps they have to overuse them. Uh, so is, is economic, I mean, growth, moving people out of poverty also a part of this effort to keep the biodiversity? I think that, that uh, I very strongly believe in that. Okay. I think as long as we have poverty around us, our efforts to conserve biodiversity are going to be very much constrained. All right. Uh, Sandesh, we've talked often about how proud we can be to be one of the very few countries in the world with such a density of population, and yet we've managed to keep both our flora and our fauna alive, and we have one of the best biodiversity in the world. Some of our neighbors have eaten up anything that moves and cut up everything that can be eaten. So how do you explain that across your journeys? You've met all kinds of people. And how, wh what, what is it about the people there and our, us 
that we should preserve. Um, even if we live in Bangalore, where you know we're just so far away from where you were traveling. That's actually a very pertinent uh, question. A lot of people ask me, now, I live in Bangalore. Now, how can I do anything to save anything in the Himalaya? We actually touched upon this topic in our talk. Electricity, power. There are simple things that every single person can do to help reduce the impact on the environment in a big way. And the three simple R's, reduce, recycle, reuse. And if 1.2 billion Indians do that in many ways, and actually India's, uh, to answer the other part of your question, India's already done a lot to save its biodiversity in spite of the population, because a big population in India does reuse and recycle in a big way. And but revere also, revere what exists. And revere, and, and, and that's one of the reasons why we have, you know, tigers and elephants, big animals coexisting with, uh, with populations, because of that inherent reverence for life that's prevalent across the country. And also, Jane Goodall puts it best when she says, together, we can save the world. Okay. Small actions of every individual counts. Thank you. We have to open it up with one more question to each of you and then five, seven minutes because I think they probably are going to throw us all out soon. They have a cutoff point. I never tire of quoting John Muir who says, uh, if you tug at something in, in nature, you find that the entire planet comes along. And it's so true, which is what you're saying. Everything is connected to everything else. And we are the biggest part of that connection. So just recognizing that is something that we can all do every day. But tell me, since you showed us all these absolutely stunning pictures, what if everyone in this room packed their bags and went off into all these places. Would that be a good thing or a bad thing? <clears throat> Not too many people here. Uh, I think we can, we can accommodate uh, the people in this room, <laughs> but I think if in many other, hundreds of other rooms, people think that way, that we can go and uh, enjoy nature, I don't think that will be a very good idea. I think tourism, very few people, people realize uh, remains a sort of a major threat to biodiversity, especially in the eastern Himalayas. What do you think? Well, I think that um, uh, tourism is a, is a double-edged sword. If swung the right way, it can do wonders for conservation. If swung the wrong way, it can destroy the very thing we're trying to protect. Right. So it's about conscious tourism. Thank you. Conscious tourism and not to look at it as that I'm going to go there as a consumer of this experience so much. A little more mindful way of uh, going into nature with respect and not to say, oh, I've consumed this bird watching this bird. So maybe part of that. So with that, uh, and I can ask them a hundred more questions, but we don't have the time. I'm going to open this up for a few questions. Maybe we'll take two or three questions so that they can answer. Please go ahead, sir. Please, we don't have time. Yeah, I'll be brief, uh, Wing Commander Bhatt, uh, from Bishop Cottons to NDA, service before self. What uh, uh, the doctor said was so relevant and it's been left out here, good governance. When you don't have good governance, you have corruption. And I've been in all those places, I've flown there, I know the whole area. Uh, I'll just give you a small example. From zero, we used to fly, drop rice for the locals. There are mythical roads made, the rice is given, they make it apang beer, and the apatanis have the beer and get sozzled. We did flood relief uh, in the 85s in, uh, from Gauhati. I think about uh, 98 tons was what we dropped, and in the papers it came something like 150 Thank tons. You. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So we need to go out to the MPs and MLAs and have them display their taxes. Thank you. A good point day. made Thank on you. governance. Thank you very much. Yes, go ahead. Mike? Hi. Uh, my name is Shashank. Uh, I have two questions, basically. Uh, life is beautiful at the molecular level also. So I was wondering uh, what kind of conservation efforts are going on at the molecular level, like preserving the genetic sequences of these diverse species, because okay. that's an important step in case we lose out one of the species due to. Thank you. Please keep that question in mind. Uh, there's a person right at the back. Please, can you hand over the mic to him? Can I just ask one more question, please? Very quickly uh, while the mic goes there, yes. The uh, caterpillar uh, fungus, uh, which you were talking about, uh, has there been an attempt to clone the gene, the Viagra gene from the caterpillar's uh, fungus? Okay, thank you. Yes, go ahead. 
Oh well, uh, here in India, most of us students are made to look at engineering or medicine as uh, just as horses do when they go on a single track. So having done that, I am a mechanical engineer now, but I want to get into sustainable technology or uh, say working in the sustainable domain. And I would really like to know the avenues open to me. I can do a master's in India, but most of the programs here are very nascent. If I do a master's in the US, the scenario there is very different from the scenario in India where biodiversity and conservation is inextricably linked to uh, sociology, which is not the case in the US where their uh, conservation model is very exclusive. So I'm really in a fix uh, as of this moment. So, mo mo moment. Thank, so thank you. Good question. This is a presentation and you did talk about people, poverty and the issue with conservation and poverty being uh, not a very well understood one. But one aspect we seem to never talk about, especially in the last 40 years, is population. Mr. Kadur mentioned about 1.2 billion, but within the next 30 to 40 years, we will be 1.8 billion. So when we start talking about conservation or even population, even if you start talking about it, which is not being done, only about 20 years from now will we make some realization about concrete plans. So how can conservation be there when population is exploding? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one last one and then I'll hand over. Yes, in the middle, please. None of the women wanted to ask questions. For the tourism and I just traveled to uh, Amarnath. Uh, very happily I started, but once I went there, I really regretted. I'm a Muslim. I still went there because I just wanted to see around. And the kind of damage, the, 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 the kind of people come there and there's no control over. I was just wondering how this government, uh, they take decisions on entering people there and why they don't do, uh, how much you can really interfere. Thank you. Uh, so, Dr. Baba, all those, you remember? Uh, yes, uh, just taking up the last one and linking it with the first one, I think partly the problem with tourism is, is governance issue. Of course, there are a number of other issues too. And uh, about the pe uh, graduate programs in uh, conservation, uh, I think if you are looking for something innovative, uh, look at the ATRI website. Uh, about the molecular work, uh, certainly it's very, very important in terms of conservation, but we have a number of priorities in conservation, so I would put that somewhere in the middle, and I, I, I make that comment with great deal of experience. For 10 years, I did molecular population genetics of tropical trees in relation to conservation, so I know what the field is, but we have a number of, number, number of very pressing issues. And I think there was a uh, question about caterpillar fungus. I don't know what it was, but we can discuss that later. And, uh, has it been cloned or something? Oh, has it been cloned? Uh, there have been efforts to culture those, uh, but they have not been very successful. That's why it continues to get collected in the wild. I neglected to mention that uh, what uh, Uttam Shirasta, who is working with me, has found during the last five years, the harvested amounts have come down to almost half. And uh, so there has been a major decline in the fungus, probably due to over-harvesting, but other reasons may, may also be involved. So yeah. uh, just um, answering one other question that was missed out. There is um, an effort by the Kew Gardens to do the, the seed bank. And there's a huge number of plants in the Himalaya that uh, have actually been preserved for the future. And uh, they, they, they have this state-of-the-art technology that keeps these seeds in refrigeration. And getting to the question of population, we are the problem. And I don't think there's going to be a solution to that unless populations stabilize and even start going down. Because as population increases, it's not just a pressure on the environment, it's the amount that we as individuals consume. Our consumerism is going up population is going up and there's only so much that nature can support. Like Mahatma Gandhi once said, nature can provide for every man's need but not for every man's greed. So that's the answer to that question. Unfortunately, it's a negative one. Just, just, uh, can I? Uh, Kew Gardens has signed a memorandum of understanding with the government of India to extend that program to India. Just, it has happened recently. The MOU has not been implemented but I've seen uh, quite a bit of correspondence about that in recent weeks. Uh, just to remind ourselves actually that our rate of growth of population has peaked. 
And actually in the south, we're already at replacement rates, and in the north also it's coming down, so it's not like it's going to explode forever, uh, geomet uh, you know, uh, in ways that will not, uh, you know. So we should remember that our rates of growth of population are stabilizing. Uh, we still have five minutes. Is there someone else who has a burning question to ask? Yes, please go ahead. We, we keep talking about man destroying nature, which has been discussed many times over. Since you were there, the fury of the Brahmaputra destroys thousands and thousands of animals every year. Have you made a plan to possibly do something about that? To, you know, okay, we'll that? take one more. Just Sandesh, just, yes, go ahead. Just start talking till the mic comes. First week I was in Himalayas, uh, from Darasu to the Gansoli. Uh, Tehri Dam was built I'm not talking about its, uh, how is it power, agriculture, or uh, thing it. But the water is getting polluted at an alarming rate, and no, no word is heard in the whole world. Thank you. Um, one last, anyone has, and then they get the last word. Yes, go ahead, the gentleman. Uh, as a documentary filmmaker, I mean, I just wonder that uh, a lot of films which have been, I mean, a lot of documentaries which have happened, you know, since, like, from my childhood in Africa, and. Uh, so a lot of destruction has happened in the areas which are considered like uh, a heaven for documentary filmmakers like Kruger National Park and Ken in Kenya. So when you make a film I mean, uh, as a documentary filmmaker, do you have a conservation angle in your mind or is it only to you know, provide, provide knowledge to people? And I just want to know that do you think documentary films uh, on environment serve as a conservation, uh, serve to conservation as well? And if Yes, how? Thank you. Good question. Uh, last qu question. The, the number of dams that are being built on the Chinese side of the border. So what can we do about that? And what is your view on dams generally? Okay. So your last... Uh, Sandesh, go yeah. first and let Dr. Baba... Let take this uh, very quickly. With uh, the Brahmaputra, yeah, with the, the Brahmaputra, it's not so much as devastation. It's actually renewal because the Brahmaputra needs to flood in order for that whole ecosystem to work like it does. The silt enriches the soil, enriches the vegetation, and that's why you have so many species living in that floodplain. So unfortunately, floods have not happened in that area for over two decades. And uh, last year, I went there in July to document the big flood. So that was a very rare thing. And uh, briefly touching on the question about dams across the border in China, it's going to have a huge impact on the lifeline of the Northeast, the Brahmaputra. And floods are not going to be as common of an occurrence. So the renewal is going to be much less. The grasslands are going to be destroyed. Woodlands may come up, which means that grassland species will not be able to habitate uh, these lands. So there's, there's a lot of interconnectedness between all of this. Just quickly answering the question on documentary filmmakers, never been to Africa, so I'm not sure about the state of affairs in Kruger or the Serengeti. Um, I don't think it's just about documentary filmmakers because there'll be a few crews, but it's the amount of tourists that go there which is probably causing a bigger impact. And I know that in India, this filmmaking is a very, very small thing, and it's not like there's a rush of filmmakers going to any one of these places because it just doesn't happen. It's uh, too far-fetched. And talking about the conservation and education benefit angle, I'm doing this because a documentary that my father brought me 20 years ago had a big impact on me. And that's why I do this, because it's education that you're trying to further to the next generation. So I think that it's a very important tool. I think the issue of dams is actually a regional issue. Uh, dams, it's not India and China alone. Uh, dams in both sides are going to have environmental impacts. On the Indian side, whatever we do affects Bangladesh. On the Western side, it affects Pakistan. So I, I don't think we can take a sort of a holier-than-thou attitude here. And on the, similarly, on the Chinese side, other countries are impacted. So it's a question of you know, regional governance and countries coming together. And of course, there are mechanisms, international mechanisms, in terms of the regulation and water. And I'm sure you know, those bodies are quite active. 
Okay, so um, thank you very much, both of you. Please do visit atri.org, visit um, Sandesh's site at Felis, and we have the India Biodiversity Portal.org, which has a tremendous wealth of information. Please pass that on to other young people, especially that you know. And uh, Dr. Bob, would it be fair to say that instead of waiting, you know, seeing a nature or something out there that we visit once in summer in our holidays, you know, why can't we reimagine our cities so that they are much more, uh, they embed much more of nature in them and they're not just concrete jungles but begin to be alive again. And that all of us can do even with planting a single uh, plant and nurturing some trees. So uh, with that, I unfortunately have to close this session. Do grab these two outside. And uh, please spread the message. The Himalayas are our natural heritage, and we all have a responsibility to save it. Namaste and thank you.